Welcome to this episode of Agriculture. And that's my little Rhinebeck girls. What are you saying, girls? Yeah, that's where we met you, was Rhinebeck initially. Yes, sir. We, we, we've been a staple there for 13 years. And uh, we, the girl that used to go, she knew the word Rhinebeck. Excuse the barn, it's a mess. I've been gone for a month, so I haven't gotten to clean. As we're, well as we're, I, we're like that, too. I'm sad I would like to. And it, it, unfortunately, in the back, we're beginning to clean, so it's kind of <laughs> torn up. We get something for the cats. We have two, we had three, the people drop cats off on us. Uh, we had three from the same litter, as little teeny weeny ones, and the neighbor rolled over one of them when I was watching. Uh, so we have two left, and rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, three kits in the tub, and who do you think they be, if you remember your mother goose? Rub-a-dub-dub. -dub. Three men in a tub. Who are they? Lost now. The butcher, the baker. Baker and the candlestick maker. So the cats are Butch, Bacon, <laughs> and the little girl is Canada. Ah, oh, thank you. We have fun with names here. I was an English major, so I, I have a lot of <laughs> a lot of stuff. I was an English major for a little while too. It's amazing how much miscellany you get in your life with that and miscellaneous information. And these are our Rhinebeck girls. Now this is I want to say Icelandic. No. Yes. Icelandic? This is Amelia. She's nine. This is her great granddaughter, Eileen, born in April. And her and I, uh, Amelia's daughter, uh, born in May, uh, June, and that's uh, Pirouette. The hungry girls. Yeah. They're cute little sheep, yeah, aren't you they? Remember them, don't you, dear? Yes. They found doing uh, intelligence studies in Britain on sheep that they have an amazing capacity to remember voice uh, faces. Just sheep? Just these? Oh. This breed or all sheep? All sheep. Uh, oh. They can remember them for a long period of time, having not oh. seen them. They recognize emotion in the shepherd's face, and they also um, are one of the only species that you can show them a picture of a sheep that they know, and they will vocalize to it. They Isn't know that, who that interesting? Is. Wow. They all know their names. They know each other's names, so I can talk about somebody that they don't see, and they'll know from what I'm saying whether it's good, bad, or indifferent news. Yes. Now that is truly interesting. I did not know that. Now, this is Madame Turbo. She's a rescue. Her name originally, she was named by a three-year-old grandson, and it was, as we think of, Turbo. And when she started doing meet and greets, I thought we need something a little classy on that. So it's still Turbo, but it's now T-O-U-R, B-E-A-U. Yes, Turbo, yes. And she comes from one of the farms over there. This is her son. This is Champ. She had a pair of twins. And I thought one was a girl and he wasn't, so he can't be with Mama right now. He's a little old. But uh, this one we had done as a baby. Yes. Tell me a little bit about how you get all this miscellany of animals. When they first started, uh, this place was completely overgrown. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but eat, goats will eat a lot. They're very picky, but they will eat a lot of things and a lot of rough things. So they invested in a bunch of sc scrub goats who have no particular breed to try and chew things down. And then uh, the sister who came, who ended up being the shepherd when I first came, uh, they thought, because they had uh, people who knit in the house, if they raised their own wool, that's something they could sell. So they got the sheep, because now, by now the burdocks are down, which are death on fleas. Uh, and then they learned from uh, uh, a friend that we have from Cyprus. He has uh, milk goats, and he was raising uh, calves. And goat milk is one of the few that can cross species. We've had calls from uh, animal rescuers for, for fawns. They can tolerate the goat milk. So they got them, they would breed them to, to freshen first, so that if one of the ewes had trouble with her lambs, they could bottle feed. Um, and uh, Eileen's mother was, was raised on goat milk. Yes, I want to get you something to eat. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Go and see the rest of the bunch, huh? Go get some hay. All right, ready? Stand back. Coming down. Hey. We feed all local hay, uh, and the guy that he's he's not consistent what he makes. Uh, but when he's on, he doesn't spread. And uh, the guy that I was buying from, I wasn't sure how I was going to break it to him. The girls began not eating his hay. He had dairy cows he spread every day. Well, of course, that comes up in the grass. They can tell, they can taste it. They they were getting so they wouldn't eat it. But what they liked the best was a. Uh, vacant field up the road and very weedy they like we these are browsers they like weedy stuff and the and the sheep have learned to do that as well and that's what they loved so this year i had to do something else and we got some from him and because uh, the regular guy's been gone now for over a year those fields have had time to kind of recover a little bit and somebody else cut them and so we got hay from him and the other uh, guy that we get hay from, or the other two, uh, those, again, are big, uh, vacant, beginning to be weedy fields. Here you go, girls. There you go, okay? All right? Ah. And a lot of cow guys <laughs> wouldn't let this hay off the, tra off the wagon because it's got the weeds in it. And I said, well, they're not making milk. You know, they don't need that kind of nutrition. They don't need 21% whatever. The girls do get some um, grain, corn, but again, the, the corn and now the grain we get is all in uh, neighboring fields. It's a local uh, feed company. Uh, you want to you put that into turbos? Sure. Put that with turbo on her boy? Just toss it over? Uh, there's a basket, should be a basket there on the front wall. Yeah, it keeps it cleaner a little bit longer. Come on. So they'll go. pull it all out, but it keeps it cleaner when they start. There you go, girls. Okay. So everybody has to have a have a have a job, but they get to retire when they get to a certain point. Is that the theory? I don't get to retire. No, these guys. I don't get to retire. The chicken gets to retire, and she didn't. She no, we actually have the two the two roosters, and you, you never can have two roosters. So she's basically the girlfriend. I don't know where Ralphie went, but the, she's the girlfriend for one of the roosters. So she does, still does it. lay. No, she every once in a while she bumps, but she's basically just. Company. Company to him. <laughs> make, make him think he's like really doing something. Uh, look, uh, like the shepherds around here, I'll have old girls. My girls routinely live up into their teens, and they'll say, because they'll ship them about eight years old. Uh, because they don't twin, you know, the, the fleece may not be as great. But see, I don't, I don't breed everybody every year, so they don't, I don't run dogs, so they don't have that stress. So they keep the, the, usually the, the fleece up into their teens, the fleece quality. And, but we go everywhere on foot. We're all over this property with the sheep. And that's another thing that they, in Europe, they know about sheep is they remember roots very well, physical roots. Because they used to take them up to the mountains in the spring for the summer and take them back down. And they knew where they were going. So these girls all know. And we can take off with younger ones and the older ones know where they're going. Watch for your turn. You see the heads. And they get to their turn, they off they go, and they can go down, they can find their way to the field. Uh, they know where the, the best stuff to eat is, they know where the water is, they know where the shade is. And that's why I keep the, the older ones, uh, they, of course they know the vocabulary, so they can teach the other ones the vocabulary. Where's your dish, where's the gate, uh, wait for me, all that stuff. The biggest uh, influence on a, on a sheep or goat's life will be whether they can keep their teeth. I hear teeth and hooves are the two things yeah. that determine the lifespan. She's got terrible, terrible feet. I have to. That's why she's in quarantine and why I gave her a baby to keep her company in quarantine because her, her feet are so bad. Um, if they can keep their teeth, they can keep on going because even old without teeth, they can bring that in, but they can't break it up. That's what the cud chewing is. They break it up for the nutrients break down all those uh, cellular things. So, so I was reading something you were talking about earlier. Um, it, was, it was talking about they let you know when it's time to go. Yes. So how, how long, because you have to really maintain all these animals, and, and I know you have some businesses here, but 
how do you determine when an animal's telling you it's time to go and how you how do you otherwise you'd be just keeping everything forever right well uh, we had uh, one uh, the, one of the last ones we put down um, the light of enjoyment just went out of her eyes and she was she was 13 so I mean I knew her and she just she went through the motions is what she did she just went through the motions because they will smile and things and she just wasn't engaged so I said something about it and she didn't she didn't really disagree because uh, I had two that should have gone uh, old weathers which are boys that can't do it anymore and you do you do that when they're young and then I run them with the flock oh no 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 they were fine no no I'm, I said you're not yeah I'm fine okay and the one what the one we did uh, seven kare we did and I said you're not okay. He was waiting for shearing. He knew the word shearing and he knew the word Nancy, who's the shearer. I said, if you even make it to shearing, we will revisit this. So he got it to shearing. The temp dropped that night. He was froze because he was just a bag of bones. I set up heat lights and so forth in here. And when uh, they had grown enough fleece, it was time for them to go out. I said, you're not going out. I'm not going to find you down with the flies all over you. You can't do it anymore. Well, he, he guessed that was true. So I called the doctor. Yeah. You, you, if, if you've seen it before, you know when to, to recognize that in any, just about any organism out there. You, you, if you've seen it before, you know. Yeah. Well, I had you one, know. a big uh, clun forest that, I, that we rescued, and I told Tina, I said, when she goes down, that's it. I said, because I'm not going to be able to muscle that around. She's about 200 pounds. She had a stroke, she was, she was in this pen, but it was carved off. And we kept it going about a year. She had to get up twice a day, uh, breakfast and supper. I said, because when you can't get up, honey, that's all I can tell you. So she did, and then one morning she couldn't. And I said, Selena, if we could make it so that you could go see Addie and Potty, who were flock mates that had been dead for years, would you like to go? I said, we can make that happen. Doc, I think she's ready. So she came, and we've only ever had to medicate because they they make it out as though that's everybody has to sedate an animal before you put them down. You don't, or we don't have to here. So I said, I don't know how this is going to go. She's not mine. She doesn't like to be handled. Be prepared. So she was down, facing out. I got on one side, and Doc got on the other. And she prefers this vein. And I said, Now I'm going to take your head, honey. So doctor can do this. You just concentrate on relaxing. You just relax. You think about Taffy and Aunt Sego, who were cows that she lived with that would have been dead. And she put the needle in. It was just like that. She even, in the, in the hay, after I took her, her pelt off, she just looked like she was relaxing. She didn't look dead. So how many animals do you have here now? You were going through the list earlier, but I don't think uh, we were rolling I, the camera. I think there's a little less than uh, a dozen goats, because we've got three big bucks there, two here that will be looking for work shortly, two little ones. And I think there's like eight or nine here. I have about 50 sheep. Uh, the cattle have, been, have found another job. Uh, two cats that live out here exclusively. Uh, we have her and her full brother, six months younger, dogs. Um, the four birds we have to go let out, and then the, the antique bird and her boyfriend. Wow, that's a <laughs> lot. Yeah. yeah. Will, you, will you take us and show us the birds? The what? Will you show us the birds? Well, certainly, yes, because oh, they need some breakfast, too. I'm going to give some to this girl, and I have to feed the dog as well. This is called hay stretcher from Blue Seal, which is at least regional. And it's pulverized uh, greenery, forage, and then they... Uh, extrude it. They probably wet it up and extrude it and make, cut it up into these little pellets. Then that I do soak for about a half an hour and it becomes like a, like a mash of not quite oatmeal. And it's all pre-chewed so anybody without any teeth can eat that. They get pretty much what they're supposed to have for forage uh, and then they don't have to worry about chewing it. Although a lot of those old ones will want grass and hay. They like the feel of it. Even though they can't do anything, it, it costs a different taste. Yeah. You want fiber, that looks like it's it. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> it. That's, I, and that's, but that's only 11% protein, so I have to kind of gear that up a little bit with the grain. 
Uh, if they need extra c calories, uh, that's why we have the con. That's for extra calories it was, if they need it, the old ones. It definitely seems like you use your medical experience, your oh, medical yeah. background. When I first came over, the flock uh, was in a terrible shape. So we had a little seance. It was me, and um, we, uh, we had a feed rep then who'd gone on to do other things, but she was from Blue Seal. And the, 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 me and the vet and the, and the feed rep, we got together in the parlor, and I took notes, and we went through the whole thing. And at that point, I had uh, all the way up, I had all these little groups, depending on their age, their physical uh, status, what they needed to eat. And I don't know how many kinds of feed we had then to, to uh, address, watch out for the step, <laughs> to address their particular uh, physical nutritional needs. And so I learned from them and then just kind of doing it and watching and what they call feeding to condition. Dauphine, here you go, honey. Dauphine, come here. Okay? All right. Poor thing, she was in with the rams, and I didn't, she was getting real thin, and I didn't realize they were beating her up for her food. And she, and she couldn't, at that point, drive them off. She has trouble with the girls. Her brother, on the hand, other hand, is very aggressive, and he has no trouble at all getting people out of his food. There you go, dear. Where's your boyfriend? Where's Ralph? Oh, there he is. There's Ralphie. There's Ralphie. Well, fake, come in and get some deed, honey. Let the people see you. There you go. We got him as half grown birds, and the, the hired man is, he's, he makes me laugh. He said, I, I've named your birds, but I don't think you'll like it. That's his standard thing. I don't think you'll like it. I said, Well, try me. He said, I called them the honeymooners. So we have Ralph and Alice and Norton and Trixie. Now, the, the, the roosters I can tell apart, because he's, he's got a very red comb. And we'll see Norton does not. The girls, I don't know who they are. They're just the girls. Okay. Yeah, we'll go feed Norton and let him out and get into trouble. Yes. Okay. Hey, girls. Get the girls to uh, eat that kind of stuff, even uh, in the fields. And there's Norton. And there's his women. Is that a Sumatra? Mm -hmm. the, the, the one chicken back there, is that a Sumatra? Is that what they mm -hmm. call the ones with a very black no, face? Uh, no, those, uh, they started out as Jersey Giants. They're, they're mutts. But uh, the base uh, one is Jersey Giants. That's why they're so dark. But if you look, they've got some brown in them from... Because I said to the woman, I said, what are they? She said, well, I don't know. <laughs> they're Jersey Giants. And this and that. Well, that's not in any of them. And they will come out. I came out one night, and they were sitting there on the dock. I said, well, how come you haven't gone to bed? Something must have been in the yard scared them. They waited me from walking back to bed because I lock them up here in the night and we do that. Now, somebody the, underneath that top, that ugly top, is a beautiful little chicken house that somebody gave us. They won't go in there on a bet. I, in the <laughs> winter, I had a light in there and they could go in and eat because, I mean, it's snow. It's, it's below zero. They sit on top of the house and I said, you know what? You know what? <laughs> Have fun, guys, because I, it's beyond, it's beyond me. Yes, you are gorgeous, aren't you? Yeah. They're beautiful. So, open or shut? Uh, open. All right. And they come out and do their thing. So, do the primitive breeds, are they any sturdier, or are, do they have any more, uh, um, more or less problems than the other sheep? Uh, I wonder how, how little, um, Resistance they have because, like the Icelandics, when they when they 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 were they were testing sheep for these Q and R uh, resistance to scrapey, and by and large the Icelandics were coming up Q Q, which means they were completely susceptible. Well, it's a is it a, one of the Viking remnants, right? So yeah. I mean, I guess if if so you make if, it in the Viking universe, you make it. If you don't, well, that's no, it. Yeah, well, and uh, so apparently that's something they haven't had to do any kind of immunity to because a lot of the more improved breeds, like the Romneys and that stuff, you can get them, I, and I had a, a family line where RR, which were both resistant to, uh, uh, not Scrapey, uh, OPP. Uh, it wasn't Scrapey, it was OPP. Now these are our little sheep houses, and they, they are totally movable, they go all over the place, I hook them on the tractor, and uh, instead of one big shed that makes, you know, really kills the grass and things, I can shift those around and I can put like uh, Amelia and the babies were in a little shed in, in a little paddock. 
uh, when Emmy and uh, Betsy were in um, end of life care, assisted care, one winter I kept the men and they really didn't, they wanted to be with the group. So the next year he had made those little tin houses and all those, uh, he's so clever. Uh, that's just one piece of the barn roofing. Was when we had the barn re-roofed, he kept all that stuff. He keeps everything. And we picked up some pallets and he's done everything in the world for uh, construction. And he, I wanted wood, he was bound, he's gonna do this. I said, fine, ah, whatever, you, whatever you want to do as long. So it's just enough for like two sheep. So you it's, just put three pallets and a, and a and barn siding. Yeah. and That's he, really smart. And then he's got the roof and he had different roofs depending on what he had. And we, we put that, so we'd call them. And then for e Emmy and uh, Betsy, it was just the two of them, take one of those cattle panels and put it out and attach it to this. Then they could be out in the middle of everybody, but not have to compete for food or, because Betsy kept getting knocked over. That was one of her problems. And they could have their own food, but still be with all their friends and family. See, now I could actually make this, and I'm about mm -hmm. the least handy person well, on the planet. I've been finding I've been finding pallets lately when I go out in the morning, <laughs> and so I just throw them in the back of the truck. So we got a whole stash coming. What we're running out of is this stuff. We've used that all up, but he'll just have to suck it up and make it with wood. <laughs> and these were made by some another friend, and he made that square one, and he made those two, and there's another square one down there, and those two you can haul around. Uh, I, he got all fancy with these two. I don't know what he was thinking, but he shingled one of them and you know, all this stuff. So, okay, whatever. Old Nam vet, he gets, he gets creative and say, yeah, go ahead. He's living in Slovakia right now, having the time of his life. So now this is technically a monastery. Mm -hmm. So what, what uh, t uh, tell me about this, because I really have no, not a whole lot of background in the Orthodox Church. Uh, it's uh, a, a long-standing tradition uh, not so much in this country, it's real, relatively new in this country, but in the old countries, uh, Greece especially, uh, Romania, uh, Russia, uh, any of those, those kinds of orthodox, and in the old times, Catholic countries, uh, in, well, it, the ethos is different east and west. In the Catholic countries, that was a lot of places where you could get the daughter that was never going to get married, you know, one of those, or the daughter that was deficient, that kind of stuff. That's good. Um, and uh, there's also the second son, uh, the third son, because the first son was going to inherit. The second, the second son went in military, went military yeah. and the third one, well, you, why don't you go be a priest? And we know how that worked out. Yeah. In the West, it wasn't seen, I mean, in the East, it wasn't seen the same. Uh, it was seen as, um, they, a lot of them, would raise their families, and right now we've got the empty nest going on, they, something they might have wanted to do, but the family wanted them to get married, by common consent. One would go to the monastery, and often both. One would go to the men's monastery, one would go to the women's monastery, and finish out their lives. Uh, and uh, because the, the focus was different, it, they weren't teaching orders, they weren't nursing orders in the East. It was basically prayer and penitence. And you can do that with, you know, and. So there's what, is there one central organization that says, okay, we need a monastery here, we'll help nope. you build it? Or nope. you guys just nope. all decide nope. to get it's together? Just, and... yeah, yeah, it's just, and historically, uh, that's one of the ways they populated the, the, the uh, Siberia and all those northern parts of Russia. For whatever reason, these people decided they weren't going to live in, in uh, you know, civilization. I mean, there, there were a lot of reasons for that, some good and some not so good. And they'd haul off and go into the, the forest and set up as a, as a religious. And then they'd get a bunch of disciples around them often, and then they'd build something and they'd all be there. But that, yeah, they, they historically, and nobody, nobody other than the landowner didn't give them a hard time. Nobody supported nothing. They were, and then as the people needed prayers and stuff, you know, the surrounding ones, they, they'd come there for prayers or clairvoyance or whatever it was that was the guy's specialty. And they would begin to give and, and help them out with uh, 
goods and services, I guess. But if I said, I, gee, I'm, we're going to go visit a monastery and we're going to visit Mother Catherine, there's an immediate picture that might go in people's heads. Okay, yeah. you're going to stand there in a wimple and uh -huh. you're going with a candle. to... With a candle. And, and, and you're, going to hear, you're going to hear a language you don't understand. And, and for 10 hours a day, that's kind of what you do. And yeah. yet... And a lot of the Greek monasteries are that way. Are they They, that they way? still are. Okay. So, but not here. T no. Tell me how many women you have here and... Uh, right now we have four. And I'm the youngest one at 68. So that gets to be a problem. Yeah. I could see it, how it would. Especially as physical as, as this can be. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you all have different jobs. You do the farm? Do you take care uh, of the farm right animals? Right now we're having trouble and I do a little bit of everything. But theoretically we'd have a bookkeeper, somebody in the bookstore, uh, somebody doing uh, like the grounds and the, and the gardens and things. Somebody, probably two people doing the, uh, the animals. Uh, we have somebody doing correspondence. And right now we all just kind of fling around. And somebody has to make product so we get something to sell. Okay, so now tell me about that. You do, you do actually have a business here. Yeah, uh, we send uh, a lot of the fleeces we can go to send to one place because that's one kind of fleece and they can handle it. We've got to run now, we're waiting for. And Sister Piyama uh, is an inveterate knitter and that's what she does. She makes these, and they're selling like hotcakes, these felted slippers. Okay. Now, this is one of our late acquisitions. We got about 80 acres. We have about eight that are open. And it was in terrible shape. The first year I used it, uh, four acres only supplied 11 dry ewes. That's how bad it was. And there was, there was multi-floral rows and there were blackberries and all of that tree line was completely grown over and hidden barbed wire. And over the years, the girls have, have brushed that all out. I do, I do feed it. I do come up and brush hog. But that's, that's all the girls' work. They cleaned out. I didn't do anything to that tree line. All right, let me calm them down. They're not, they're not expecting me now. Uh, Amelia had a bad foot this summer, so she was in there with the babies, and that was her shade and so forth, so she was together. Come on! <laughs> Thundering herd. And, the, and she's always the first one, that black one. That's Amelia's sister. That's Krasavica. And last night she came down, both of her daughters were with her. They outrun everybody. Come on! <laughs> yeah, you might be able to do something with the now, This is Krasavica, and that's, uh, those, the brown ones are her daughters. There you go, sweetheart. That's Twist and Stremba. And there's 13-year-old Teddy. Yes, Teddy, come on, come on. And this is a rescue. This is Shetland uh, Dolly, where her sister died. Beautiful eyes, look at those yellow eyes almost. Yeah. Come on. And there's 13-year-old Zini, she's a churro. Yeah. Coming up here with the this, horns. That one right there. Oh, this is the dark brown one. Yeah. Ah. And this is, that's epic. And there's Cloud. And there's Anthea and Gilda. And what about the big guys here? The this big girls. Up? Yeah. That's QT. That's, his mother's that one with the tag. That's Q. And this is QT. He was fly struck. That's, and that's directly attributable to, um, that's tasty. He's another um, Iceland uh, churro. What, yes. what breed are they though? They're, they're that really was a big. crossbred. We don't really, it's a Romney cross, but we don't really know what. They think it might be some Icelandic, might be some Dorset. Uh, really big. Yeah. You can see the differences in and size. Th this here. is Icelandic. This is a baby doll. That's an Icelandic. There's Old Biscuit. He's an Icelandic. Oh he's, boy, look at those horns. He's only nine. Uh, but he's also intimately confused, poor thing. Come on, girls. Yes, I may. And this is, she was supposed to go to Einbeck. That's Miss Maple. And that one with the tail is her daughter. And, uh, yeah, this, this is Ozymandias. 
Nice. Ozymandias. <laughs> and, and he was fly struck a couple of times. This is Buffalo. He's nine. He's a churro cross. Yes, big on. Big on. There you go, sweetie. Do you have any problems with the churro, the churros and churro crosses up here and since it's so damp and that's very different from the areas I've seen them in? Surprisingly, they get along quite well up here. The, I, the oldest chief I ever had was a churro. Uh, she had her first babies at nine. Uh, wow. Buffalo and his sister. Where's Where's Carol? Carol, come on. And uh, she lived to be 16, and then the heat and humidity prolonged. Uh -huh. She just she couldn't sustain it. Yes, yes, yes. Hey, Shouty. Don't know who I am. Huh? Come on, guys. Come on, Lester. Here comes my bellwether, Lester. Come on, Lester. Now explain to me why bellwether would be familiar to us. And how, it, how that word originated, if you know. A weather is a ram that's had his pocketbook emptied. Come on, girls. Come on, uh, Louise. And what, uh, in Europe and some of those places where the sheep move, they, they do, this is Teddy. She's, she, she was my, one of my original Rhinebeck girls. She's 13. Uh, they keep bells on them. They know from the way the bell rings, if there's problems in the field, they know where they are. And the bellwether, there's Karen. Uh They um, they can tell where they are, and, and so can the girls. And so they, they know where the flock is, when, when, especially when they're in transit and at night. The biggest thing is at night when, uh, hi honey, hi honey, he's the biggest, he's nine, he's eight. He's eight, he had a birthday this year, he's eight. Hey, so is that literally the, the origin of the word bellwether? Yeah. Because that's a signal for all things that are coming and what, this, what the status, that's the bellwether. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And I, I made him into the bellwether because he's got that beautiful swan neck for the collar. Uh, 